Well, a very big good morning to everybody. Welcome. Well, hang on. Hang on. Good morning. I know there's only a few of us, but we can speak loudly. Huh? Good morning to everyone. So happy to have everyone here at church this morning. Welcome to the Eaton Community Church. Happy to worship together. Uh, a couple quick announcements again. Um, we're not passing the plates. They're out at the uh, front desk. You can drop uh, your offerings there, of course, online, or you can mail them as well. Um, Last week, there was a technical glitch as we started live streaming, so we apologize. There was no audio for the first part, and we couldn't uh, fix that until after the first round of singing ended, so we could get on the computer to do that. Um, seems to be working today, so uh, hopefully if you're tuning in, um, we're live. Hello. Hello, everybody in the front room. Glad you're joining us today. Um, also, the sermon notes are up on the website. We're trying to put those up on Saturday. Um, so you can go on and print them off as we're not handing bulletins out at this time. So, so thank you for being here. If you'll all stand with me here this morning as we read from God's holy word. We'll be reading from Proverbs 31, 29 through 31. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let all who have ears, let them hear. Let's pray for the service this morning. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, it's uh, so nice. What a portrait in scripture we read this morning. Father, of uh, the beauty of a godly woman. We are thank thankful for them in our lives. We are thankful that you surround them with, with them. Father, thankful for this day, the day you have made for us. We acknowledge the privilege to call you Father, to worship you in our lives. Father, to honor you with our lives. So thank you for calling us your sons and your daughters. Father, we, we fail, we fall short. Help us recognize those shortcomings and to be able to repent them and turn them over to you. Father, in this time when things seem to be so upside down, when things seem to be stacked against us, let us remember and rejoice in the ultimate victory we have in your son. In his obedience and the work he did on our behalf on that cross so that we can be called your sons and daughters, Father. So we're thankful for your wisdom. We trust in your goodness. We acknowledge your truth. We ask for your spirit to be here with us today and we ask for it to transform us. And we're thankful for your son, who we ask this prayer through in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing as we worship the Lord this morning. You can go ahead and remain standing for just a moment as we read God's word in just a second. I did want to mention, if you thought you saw a new face up here today, you did. That was... Cole Gustafson, he's the uh, grandson of June, and uh, we're happy to have him here. I'm not sure I've ever officially met you, Cole, so I look forward to maybe doing that after service today, okay? Thanks for being with us, and thanks for helping out. Well, we're in 1 Timothy, back in 1 Timothy this morning. It's been, been a long vacation, and uh, I'll be reading today from chapter 2, beginning in verses 9 and 10, actually starting in verse 8, where we left off. He says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the, uh, for the word that you've given us this morning. We pray that you'll help us as we examine it to 
have open hearts, uh, as it is most particularly to women this morning. We pray that uh, that will also produce open hearts. But Father, that some of the principles here are for all of us, and I pray that we will be paying attention and catch those. Thank you for your word, Lord. One of the great benefits of expository preaching, you have to touch every verse. And uh, so as it comes, so we take it, and uh, we pray that you'll bless our time this morning. So much going on in our country, Father, so many issues, so many hearts that need to change. Lord, we see the efforts to change uh, just by outward appeal, and certainly there are places where that needs to be done. But we pray for hearts that would turn toward you. We pray that hearts would seek forgiveness and cleansing and that from the inside out, we might see a revival in our country and in our world. We pray that we would all hear the message that you're delivering through all of these things that are coming because we have no doubt, Father, that you, the awesome God of the universe, who could stop anything in its tracks, are allowing everything that's going on for a purpose, to get our attention. So I pray that you'll start with us who are believers, but that you'll work out from there as well. People will turn to you. We will see something that we never expected. See our country turning back to you. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and if you would turn with me, please. I'll try to remember, now that we got people in the balcony, I forget to look up there. I'll try to look at you, wink at you once in a while, but uh, thanks for being there and thanks for being here. Appreciate everyone who is here this morning and for those who are continuing to watch at home. We're glad we have the technology to be able to do that. First Timothy chapter 2, we are back to today. I think as I read this passage, you know, the first thought that came to me is that only a fool would, uh, would address women about clothing and uh, beauty, right? Well, here I am. But uh, I will say I am not here as an advisor. I'm here as a messenger from the one who created women and the one who created beauty. And it's his message that we need to pay attention to, right? God has been interested in how both men and women dress ever since he gave them new clothing in the Garden of Eden. I realize that the symbolism there went far deeper than just outward clothing, as we will see this passage does as well. But God is interested in how we conduct ourselves and how we conduct our lives. I don't think there's a... I I guess I also want to say in kind of an opening, this is not targeted any person. The only person that I have in view when I'm putting a sermon together, I want you to know, is me. Just me. I can honestly say I have never come into a service at this church or any other church and been, had somebody that I had targeted. So if you feel like you have been, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not me. And I, I think it's important that we realize I think we do a pretty good job on what we will talk about today. But our world will not conform to what we're going to talk about today. And I want you to know why these things are important as Paul has laid them out for us. I don't think there's a man or a woman alive who doesn't want to be attractive. And what Paul is saying to us here this morning is, listen, it's God that has put that desire in your heart. All good desires come from God. It's the question of how we use them. Satan would, would manipulate all of them out of control. But God has given us the desire to be attractive, to be beautiful, and the world will tell us all the wrong ways to do that. Paul is saying here's the right way to do that. Here's the way that will be beneficial to others and to you. And while the world puts limits on those who can be beautiful, God has no such limits. There are no such limits with God. And I think that's important for many of us to realize as well. Now, this chapter earlier, as we left it several weeks ago, was talking about the role of men in public worship, how to express their masculinity in public. And he said that the way to do that was to pray for those who are outside of Christ, those who are lost, for a world that needs to know him. This is part of how they need to display who they are in Christ. This is the heart of God. Show them God's heart. 
I think given that, we could come to this passage that we read this morning and begin to think, well, man, this, this seems a little bit trivial, what Paul has to say to the ladies here talking about dress. But he's going to get deeper than that. And I think he's showing how to express femininity in public and in public worship, how to show off personal beauty in a way that will display God's beauty. And that is equally important. That's the heart of God as well. And so there's all kinds of reason to pay attention here to what God has to say. God is interested in all of us being attractive because that shows him off well. But there's the world's way and there's God's way. And we want God's way, do we not? His way is always going to be best. So true beauty as God sees it. We're going to examine the attitude, the apparel, and the actions of beauty. So first of all, the attitude of beauty, and if you wanted to summarize that in one word, it would be modesty, modesty. A lady was talking to a friend after church one day, and she said to her, uh, hey, did you, did you see Mary's uh, hat that she had on today? And, and the lady said, well, no, I, I, I didn't notice. She said, well, did you see Louise's dress that she had on? She said, well, no, you didn't notice that either. She said, well, so what good does it do you to come to church? Well, I hope you're not here for a fashion show, right? Either to see one or to put one on. That would sort of miss the point. That's not why we're here. But we can dress well. And God would like to see us do that. It says in this passage, women adorn themselves with modesty and self-control. Modesty and self-control. These are inner virtues. Inner virtues. And they remind us at the beginning here that true beauty starts inside. Proverbs 15, 13 says, A glad heart makes a cheerful, or the word could be translated pleasing, or pleasant, or attractive face. So it starts with the heart. Peter expands on that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, where he says, But let your adorning... Be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. So both of these men, Solomon and Peter, are saying, attend to your heart more than you do your makeup mirror because people will notice if you really do that. Paul here gives two words to describe the attitude of beauty. He gives us modesty and self-control. The word modesty is a word which comes from a root which means without shame. In fact, uh, fact, the King James Version of the Bible translates this, women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness, meaning realizing that you could dress in a way that would be shameful to others and shameful to yourself. So don't do that. He doesn't want us to go there. What would do that? Dress which is seductive, dress which is purposely provocative, basically dress which says, look at me, look at me. And that could apply to men or to women, could it not? We make sure that that's not what we're doing. So that's the first word, modesty. Self-control speaks of keeping things in their proper place. Now given that what he has in mind here is relating to sensual appeal, What he's suggesting is that our dress should help us keep that sensual appeal in the right place. Sensual appeal is something, sensual desire, sexual desire, something that is a gift from God, is it not? That's where we get it. God made it up. God knows way more about it than Hugh Hefner ever did, I promise you, despite all of his experimentation and everything else. God is the one who invented this. God is the one who has gifted this to us. But what Paul is saying here is it needs to find its expression within the confines of marriage, the Bible tells us elsewhere. That's where it has its proper expression. Otherwise, it becomes a a fire that's burning out of control. It's a great gift expressed, that can be expressed, to the wrong people in the wrong place in the wrong time. So self-control in public dress is essential for a woman who desires, strives, wants to be a godly woman. What is honorable in the marriage bedroom arouses 
damaging passions elsewhere. And a woman of God knows how to dress attractively without arousing those passions. Now, this is not, beloved, you know, I kind of grew up where dowdy dress was kind of honored. You know, this, is not, this is not a promotion of dowdy dress or no makeup or downgrading of natural beauty. It's not that. Nowhere in the Bible is it that. That's not the point. We should all strive to present ourselves attractively, but without driving to be the center of attention. I mean, how many of us sometimes sit there and kind of look in the mirror and say, you know, what's everybody going to think? Probably the wrong motivation. So a woman needs to examine her motives in dress. It is, is it her intention to show forth the beauty and the grace of, of womanhood? Is it her intention to bring honor and show her love and devotion to her husband? Should be a good thing. Is it her intention to reveal a humble heart that is wanting to worship God? Or is it her intention to flaunt her feminine charms? An attitude of modesty and self-control will, will lead to a dress that excites neither the passions of the individual nor the passions of others. She doesn't downplay her natural beauty. That would be to draw attention to herself in a negative way. So you can do this both ways. But neither does she flaunt it. It's the world's way to flaunt it, isn't it? I can't open even my email without being bombarded by pictures of the latest celebrity's dress, you know, inappropriate dress, the highest slits, the lowest cleavage, whatever, at the latest award show on the red carpet or the latest vacation outing in some exotic place. That It all is as though I would care. We are called to be different. Called to be different. It's part of who you are in Christ, to be different from the rest of the world. You know, the, the example here is pretty easy to pick out, right? The Kardashians is the best example I can think of, of celebrity without any value whatsoever. As far as I can tell, they have become famous by showing off their bodies with no redeeming social value. I cannot see there that they have any visible intelligence, any visible <laughs> thing that they're really sponsoring that would be worthwhile, except promotion of self. And I would just say to the young ladies in the audience and the older ladies as well, if this is your issue, but if those are your heroes, you need to rethink your priorities. It's not women that we should be looking at as someone to look up to or to emulate in any way. That's what Paul is saying. Such shameless practices cannot end well. They will not end well. And I'll tell you one, one other thing, especially for you young ladies. Any guys that you attract with that kind of dress, as soon as they get used to being around you, they'll be looking for the next hot thing. I promise you. That's the way it works. They will not be around. God has given us bodies to enjoy, but we must not identify ourselves or value ourselves by our dress. An attitude of modesty and respect for self and others in Christ is what God is looking for here. I mean, dress as though Christ were watching, because guess what? He is. He is. An attitude of a godly mother, of a godly woman, is that she would not be ashamed or, or want to distract anyone from worshiping God. She would not want to be the center of attention as she comes to church, either because she's underdressed or overdressed. She would not want to contribute to someone's lustful thoughts. She hates sin so much that she would avoid anything that might tempt herself or someone else. This is not, by the way, a new problem. I mean, I think we look at it in every age and think it's a new problem. It's just that they had different standards. This has been a problem in every age that has ever been. Listen to John Calvin in 1555, the great reformer, greatest theologian of the Reformation. He says this, we would no longer see lewdness in dress. He's suggesting that he has seen it. We would no longer see lewdness in dress or in gesture or in speech as the world currently provides too excessive a license, 1555. For when men and women dress in such a way as to seduce each other and to entice each other into immorality, are they not all the more engaged in prostitution? That was 1555. I don't know what he would do if he was alive today. 
I mean, he'd turn over in his grave, I guess, if he knew what was going on. He'd never make it. So ladies and men also, we must ask, why, are, why do we dress the way I do? Is it to bring glory to God? Is it to bring glory to myself? Is it to call attention to him or is it to call attention to me? Proper dress starts then on the inside, at the heart. So secondly, what is the apparel of beauty? The apparel of beauty. If I were to give this a one-word description, I would say moderate. The apparel is moderate. If the, if, the, if the attitude of beauty is modesty, what does the actual dress code look like? Pretty simple, moderate. You know, if you want inches from the floor and so and well, all that stuff, don't have that for you. But I can tell you moderate is the answer. We'll talk about what that means. It doesn't mean, you know, funereal black or granny dresses. It doesn't mean no makeup or no jewelry. It doesn't. Paul's simple instruction here leaves plenty of room for creativity. Look at verse 9 again. Likewise, also the women adorn, should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, costly attire. The word adorn is a good word. It means to, it means literally, the dictionary definition of this is to create an attractive appearance through decoration. So there's nothing wrong with decorating up a little bit with looking attractive. We get our word, the, the, the Greek word is cosmeto, we get our word cosmetic from that. So it gives you a clue. And the word respectable is the same root word. So Paul is really saying adorn yourself in an attractive manner that is, a, that is, that is a, a adorning apparel. It is asking you to enhance the natural beauty that you have as best you can in the way that you dress. John Stott, the great Anglican Pastor says this about this passage. He says, when a woman adorns herself, she seeks to enhance her beauty. There's no biblical warrant for these verses for women to neglect their appearance, conceal their beauty, or become dowdy or frumpish. The question is how they should adorn themselves. Exactly. That's the question. It is to be tasteful. It is not to be provocative or seductive. It is for God's glory, not ours. To show this can apply to men, too, I, I can tell you, I had a, a, a youth director many, many years ago in a church, and uh, he's a great guy, everybody liked him, but he would come to church, you know, his clothes looked like, and his hair looked like, it just looked like he just fell out of bed. And so uh, I finally decided I probably needed to talk to him one day, so I pulled him aside and I said, uh, you know, what's going on? You, 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 you kind of look like you know, you did, like, like you don't care how you dress. And he says, well, he says, I'm not a very good-looking guy. He said, I didn't think it made much difference what I look like on the outside. So I took him to Psalm 139, and we, and we went through that passage there in Psalm 139, which, by the way, we're going to talk about next week. We're going to take a week off again because it applies kind of to this passage. So come, particularly young people, come. But everybody come. But, but it'll be, it'll, you'll enjoy it. But but in Psalm 139, it talks about how we're made the way God made us to be, to accomplish the mission that God has for us. And so we talked our way through that. And as we talked our way through it, you know, we said, you know, we need to give God the best that we have in every way that there is, including how we dress, how we present ourselves to people. It was transforming for him. Never thought about it that way. But that's what God's asking us to do, to dress carelessly. Listen carefully now. To dress carelessly is to imply we don't think much of what he made. Does it not? That's what it implies. We don't think much of what God made. We can be just as distractive underdressing as we can overdressing. Now back to 1 Timothy. There is a negative. Paul says not, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly attire. What does that mean? No braids, no fancy hairdos, no jewelry or anything other than maybe what you get at Kohl's or Target's. Not that there's anything wrong with Kohl's and Target, but you get the, you get the point. Is that what he's saying? Listen to what it, There's a commentator named James Hurley. Listen to what he says about this, because I think he kind of nails what this means in the, con, in the cultural context that Paul was writing to. He says, Paul refers to the elaborate hairstyles fashionable among the wealthy and worn by courtesans. 
The sculpture and liter liter literature of the period show that women often wore their hair in enormously elaborate arrangements with braids and curls interwoven or piled high like towers and decorated with gems and or gold and or pearls, making a shimmering screen for their locks. In other words, they were dressing very ostentatiously. Their dress definitely said, look at me. That's what Paul's against. He's not against fitting dress. He's not against suitable apparel, but he's saying not appearance for appearance sake. You know, let's face it. Some of us are just naturally more flamboyant than others, right? And there's room here for personality. But we just don't want to be going overboard. We want to keep it simple. And I think there's another thing we have to realize, which is that cultural mores have something to do with how we dress. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is what would be appropriate in Iran today would not necessarily be appropriate here, nor vice versa. The whole setup is different. The way people look at things is different. What was appropriate in 1800 wouldn't necessarily be appropriate now, or vice versa. That's why it's, that's why it's hard to judge the appropriateness of dress, you know, by the length of the hemline. They used to, when I was young, they would have the girls in certain places get down, you know, and if your hem was so much above whatever, you had to go home and change. And, and, and not, not that I think that was all bad, but what I'm saying is the length of the hemline isn't the issue. Let me t here's what the issue is. Here's what Paul is saying. Now listen carefully. What Paul is saying is don't be the one pushing the boundaries of propriety, whatever they are in your culture. Don't be the one that's way out there. Don't be the one who is overtly appealing to the sensual nature of others. Be in the middle. You know, there's, a, there's, there's a verse in the old King James that said, let your moderation be known to all men. I think that's a great verse because it helps us both in terms of our, our dress and our behavior and everything else, find the middle. There's plenty of room in the middle for creativity and for beauty. Don't seek the shortest, the lowest, you know, the tightest, the costliest. That's what he's saying. Seek to be in the middle. Cultivate modesty. God is saying dress attractively but without sexual suggestiveness or ostentation. Beth Moore is, you know, is not exactly my favorite teacher, but she says this very well and very bluntly. She says this, I remember when a mom said to me, I just wish these girls had some idea what they're putting these boys through. Being a woman with two daughters, I said, are you out of your mind? Of course they know what they're putting them through. That's why they're doing it. It's power. She goes on and she says, when we are showing everything, we are agreeing with the world that we are only as good as we are sexually desirable. But we can be cute and modest at the same time. I've made my bed in hell. I know what it's like to think you can wield power if you can get them to look at you, but I also know the freedom and beauty and modesty of Christ. When you reveal all your secret stuff, you have given away your ministry and you're saying, I believe that's all I'm worth. Cover yourself up. Be darling women. Be good at what you've been called to do and cover up the places that were meant only for nobody, not for anybody's eyes except your husband's. When I read that, I thought of uh, something I read a, a few years ago. Um, there was a model named uh, uh, Kylie Bissetti, Bissuti, Bissuti, I think it is. She was named the uh, Victoria's Secret Model of the Year uh, in 2009, or, or New Model of the Year. Okay, I don't remember which one it was, but obviously she's a beautiful young woman who was given awards by this organization that's known for its skimpy clothing. Well, a couple of years later, she came to faith in Christ. And it changed everything. She shocked her world when she said she wasn't going to model lingerie anymore. Somebody asked her why. News organization asked her why. She said, because I'm a Christian and reading the Bible more, I was convicted about it. My body should be only for my husband. She paid a price for that. 
I mean, the, the organization lambasted her, made her look like a fool. But she just picked up the pieces where the Lord left her, began a, a ministry where she puts out devotionals for young ladies. I think she's got a clothing line or some kind of line of things that she does and has, uh, has carried on, true to the faith, that the, the things that the Lord showed her were correct. So that's the apparel of beauty. What about the actions of beauty? The actions of beauty. And if you wanted a one-word word summary of this, it would be morality. Morality. This is where it seems surprising, and yet, I think those of us who've been around a little while realize there is so much truth in this. It turns out that true beauty has little to do with what you wear. You can wear the most beautiful thing or the skimpiest thing and still be somebody that nobody wants to be around. True beauty is what you do. This is what Paul is teaching here in verse 10. Look at he says, what is the proper attire for women who, produce, who, who profess godliness? Good works. You want real beauty? Then realize it's not about your looks nor your clothing. It's about what you do. It's about, it's about what springs up from the heart that has, that has seen Christ as Savior, that has seen Christ die in my place, that has seen me have salvation because of him alone, and now wanting to give myself back to him in the best way I can in the way that I live my life. And when I do that, guess what? It's beautiful. True beauty comes from the inside, but it works its way out. So what this means is beauty is not as beauty looks. Beauty is as beauty does. That's why we said earlier, anyone can be beautiful. It's a question of living out a Christ-like lifestyle. 1 Peter 3, 4 again, we read it earlier, but here it is again. Look at it from this perspective. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty. Imperishable lasts forever. That kind of beauty, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's eyes very precious. In other words, the outward beauty that the world cherishes, you know, we all know it's going to flag, bag, sag, and and disappear very quickly, is it not? Wrinkle. But the gentle spirit resulting in selfless care toward others produces a beauty that will follow you all the way through your life and into eternity. Because there are rewards in eternity relate to how we live now, and some of our beauty there will be dependent on what we've done here. It's imperishable. That's what Peter says. That means you can't do away with it. It's forever. So the best beauty secret there is, spend less time looking in the mirror and more time looking to Christ. Romans 13, verse 14, Paul says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Adorn yourself in him. You know, we spent a whole series, some of you remember, far enough back in Ephesians 4, where it talks about the, the, the spiritual dress code for a believer. It says every morning when you get up, put this stuff off and put this on. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Here's what it says in summary. It says, put off your old attention hog self, which, longs, which belongs to your former man. The attention hog I threw in there, but you get the point. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. You say, well, what does that look like? Well, he goes on in the, in the rest of the chapter and tells us. The things you're to put off, what are they? The things you take off are manipulation, lies, stealing, gossip, taking advantage of people, slander, bitterness, holding grudges. Picking on that one again today, sorry. Take all of those off. And what do you put on? You put on integrity, put on self-control, Put on gracious and edifying speech. Put on honesty. Put on tenderness and forgiveness. You start putting those things on, I tell you, people will find you attractive. I've seen people 
that you would look at just on the outside if you didn't have anything to do but see their outward appearance and you say, wow, that's not a very good looking person. And within a few minutes of seeing them and being around them, you forget all about what they look, what they look like outwardly. Why? Because the inner beauty has shown in such a way that you don't even remember. I've seen that happen many times, and it could happen for all of us. That's what God's calling us to be. Beauty that dazzles comes from the inside out. Robertson McQuilkin, he was the president of Columbia International University in South Carolina. He once drove an elderly friend to the airport. She had, the elderly friend had, had arthritis and uh, was pretty crippled up. And she said, Robertson, why does God let us get old and wrinkled and weak? He answered this way. He said, I'm not sure, but I have an idea. I think God gives strength and beauty to youth that fades as we age to remind us that physical things are not permanent. It also urges us to strive for the permanent strength and beauty found in service for Christ and others. That is a great example. That's, that is so right on. Exactly what Paul is saying. So why, especially, uh, you know, just my heart is for you young ladies. De why not develop permanent beauty now, even in your youth? This is a good time to start. Come dressed in good works and godliness, and I, I promise you, people will pay attention. Most of all, God will pay attention. And that's a good person to have pay attention, isn't it? Middle-aged couple were sitting on the couch, you know, one day, lounging around. The husband had his head in his wife's lap. They were just enjoying a time of, you know, talking together. And she took his glasses off. She looked down. And she said, you know, sweetheart, without your glasses, you look, this, you look like the same handsome young man that I married. He looked up at her and laughed, and he said, you know, with my glasses off, you look pretty good, too. <laughs> Physical beauty fades, does it not? It does. You can do the best you can. You can use all the creams you want. And I'm not against any of that stuff. Do all you can. But it's going to fade. Paul says when that's all you concentrate on, you will overdo it. Look away from the mirror for a while and look to Christ. Develop the beauty that will last forever. Now, I've saved one word for the young ladies and young men you can listen in. But here it is. Don't neglect your looks and your clothing within the bounds that God has established here. Don't neglect them. But concentrate more on a heart that loves Jesus and that loves others. The guys that you attract by mere outward beauty will move on as soon as they see the next big thing, and they will. To get the right kind of guy, you have to concentrate on the inner beauty more than the outward beauty of the body. That's the beauty that will attract the right kind of guy. The only way, the only way, listen carefully, the only way to get the right kind of guy is to be the right kind of girl. And guys, same goes for you too, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sometimes how very practical your word is. We thank you that in every way you want us to be the best we can be. But Lord, help us to remember that always what we're here for is to focus attention on you, not on us. And so would you please help us in every way that we live, from our apparel to the way we speak, to the way we carry ourselves, to remember that slovenliness, sloppiness, is not really on your agenda for us, but neither is ostentation, certainly neither is seductiveness outside the bounds of marriage where it's wonderful. And so, Lord, help us to follow your guidelines. The, the great thing is, when we follow your guidelines, it benefits us more than any other kind of lifestyle there ever is or was. And it makes us, Lord, it allows you to look on us with favor. Not that as a Christian we can lose our salvation or we can lose your love. We can never do that. But you can look on us with great favor when we're paying attention to the commands you give us. It shows we love you. 
say we do, now here's our opportunity to show it. Bless us now as we close our service. Help us to make any of the decisions we need to as we come before you this morning in humility and in obedience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.